Welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 25 where we'll talk about some of the problems in studying fossil plants. And oh boy, we have some challenges ahead of us. All right, there's two major difficulties in studying fossil plants. First, the systematic relationships of plants and very primitive protists, these are the photosynthesizing single-celled eukaryotes, um, it's a bit of a mess. And it used to be that all of these single-celled organisms, protists, were all stuffed into a single kingdom. But clues from molecular phylogenies have caused us to realize that many of these groups probably deserve their own kingdoms. The other problem with studying fossil plants is that they're not just a single body. Plants have leaves, and they have roots, and they have trunks. They have pollen, and they have seeds, and even different sexes, and some even have really complicated life cycles that we'll go into. So it's difficult to pick up a single fossil and have a good idea of what the entire plant actually looked like. So paleobotanists have to use form taxa. All right. So the old system of five kingdoms of life might have been something that you were introduced to when you were uh, taking high school biology. There are the animals, the plants, the fungi, and the protists. These are the single-celled eukaryotic organisms. And the bacteria, so five kingdoms. Hence, all eukaryotic single-celled organisms are placed within a single kingdom. Now, more recently, folks studying bacteria decided to split bacteria into two kingdoms, the eubacteria and the archaeobacteria, or archaea, with six kingdoms now. But today, things are getting a little strange, a little freaky. So, for example, if we look at a cladogram of fungi and animals, we note that fungi are starting to represent two groups. One more closely related to animals, and the slime molds being more distantly related. So one could actually argue that fungi should actually be split into separate kingdoms. So we'd have seven kingdoms! Now the real big kicker is if we start looking at single-celled eukaryotes and started looking at their phylogeny, the protista. Um, now some of these groups are going to be more closely related to animals and fungi, while others are going to be more closely related to plants. Hence, the protista doesn't seem to be representing a single monophyletic group, but in fact, a polyphyletic group. So eek! Oh man! If there's one thing that we can all agree on, is that plants are green. And they're green because they contain chloroplasts. These organelles allow for photosynthesis. Now, some prokaryotic bacteria also have chloroplasts the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria. And it is thought that the chloroplasts that are found in plant cells are basically the cyanobacteria that have been incorporated into the eukaryotic cells of plants. This allows both the cyanobacteria and the eukaryotic organisms to have chloroplasts and to do photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a pretty complex chain of chemical reactions that basically take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, combined with water and photons, light waves, to create sugars and oxygen. The oxygen is a waste product, while the sugars are used as a source of energy. Now, the strongest evidence that there is that chloroplasts are actually invaginated cyanobacterial cells is the fact that chloroplasts have their own DNA, which is arranged in a circle similar to what you find in prokaryotic cells. The endosymbiosis hypothesis that this is uh, describing is that early eukaryote, eukaryotes incorporated protokaryotic organisms within the cell, giving them a superpower of photosynthesis. They also incorporated mitochondria, allowing for cellular met metabolism. Now, what's peculiar is that the groups that gain the chloroplasts actually go on to form the groups that include plants, while the eukaryotes that just have the mitochondria 
go on to form the fungi in animals. Now, botanists have been looking at chloroplasts in plant cells, as well as various single-celled photosynthesizing groups. And they are realizing that there are many different types of chloroplast organelles, and that many of these different organisms came by these separately, with separate events. So for example, there is a blue uh, glocophyllite found in some primitive algaes, um, the red rhodophyte found in red algaes, and the chloroplastade, which is a group of chloroplast cells that are found in green algae and plants. So many of these might have different types of chloroplast organelles. Now to make things a little bit more complicated, these different types of chloroplasts were acquired in different amounts and different quantities. It's like these cells were filling their pockets with different types of chloroplasts and using them when needed. Sometimes chloroplasts were stuffed together in such that you actually get these double or triple cellular walls forming. So this character is likely a really complicated character that probably involved, evolved many times across numerous different lineages. Now the one thing that everyone seems to uh, agree on is when the origin of photosynthesis occurred. And it really took off. Um, and this is, this is during the period of time between the boundary between the Archean and the Protozoic, when the atmosphere began to be filled with oxygen. Hence, these early single-celled photosynthesizing life forms were the first polluters of the planet. And we've been breathing in their pollution, oxygen, ever since. The evidence for this change is in the fact that banded iron formations, BIFs, are not found during the Proterozoic, except for some brief intervals of global glaciation at the end of the Proterozoic. All right, so in this class, we're going to try to keep all of this simple, as simple as we can. So here's the classification of the various groups of life. We have the prokaryotes, the Monatra uh, kingdom, uh, which includes cyanobacteria, archaea, and bacteria, eubacteria. Then we have the eukaryotes, which include the protista, and these include the chlorophyte green algae, the uh, Christophytate, the golden brown algae, which also includes the diatoms, the pyrophyllite, the dinoflagellates, and the charophyllite, the brown algae, and the rhodophyte, the red algae. Now plants are most closely related to the green algae. On the other side, we have the eukaryotes that lack chloroplasts. These include the gymnocato, the uh, slime molds, the mastia macata, the aquatic fungus, and the amastia macata, macata <coughs> the mushrooms. And of these, the masco macata, the aquatic fungus, is the one that appears to be the most closely related to animals. And so that's kind of where these things sit. We'll talk about the algaes in, um, next week, and we'll also talk about the uh, fungi and the fossil record of fungi in a separate lecture. Now, I mentioned that plant systematics is debated. So here is a classification of plants from the Stuart and Rothwell book and what William Tidwell lists in his paleobotany book. Now, many of the names and the ranks of, the, of those names are different. Um, we're going to try to use the names listed in the Stuart and Rothwell book, but don't freak out if I slip in some different names for the, uh, for the various groups. Note that most of Tidwell names are divisions, and so they end with phyta, um, while the Stuart and Rothwell um, classify many of these groups within the classes and then end in opstia. So basically, the endings are slightly different. Um, and so the Tidwell is a little bit more, I think, a little bit more uh, modern. Um, and so we'll be using kind of both of these terms, but I'll just kind of help clarify it. Uh, we'll try to stick with what we're using in our textbook. All right, finally, we have the very practical problem of form taxa. That is a name or a genus that's linked to a particular portion of the planet. For example, a seed genus, or a leaf genus, or a pollen genus. This is useful to paleontologists because it allows for classification without having to know the complete parts of a plant. But it can be very confusing to students. All right, so here's a hypothetical example. 
Imagine that you're studying fossil pollen, and you find a form of fossil pollen, and you name it Triangulus. Now, another worker could be working somewhere else. They could find a piece of wood, and hence they could come up with a name, and they call that Tubrius. Well, another researcher might find a piece of seed, and they might name that Ovius. And finally, a worker might find part of a leaf and might uh, decide to name that Fondiamesis mimi. Now, none of these workers may suspect that, in fact, all of these fossils came from the exact same plant. Thus, they found them all together and preserved, which is kind of rare. Or what they might suspect is that they came from the same plant is if they are closely related to a living form that has this type of pollen and wood and seed and leaves. And so then we would know that they all come from that type of plant. All right, so for this particular plant, they all come from the coconut palm, Cocos nefraria, the black coconut. So, a true biological species. So, you rarely find all the components of a plant at a single fossil locality. So, form tacks are useful, but they can be problematic as well. These are some of the problems in studying fossil plants. All right, thanks for watching another lecture video. If you are interested in taking a course at Utah State University in geology, check out the geology website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and the research that I do, check out my website at benjamin Thanks again for watching another lecture video.